uh, you know, the low was a much different breed of animal, you know, like it, you know, it was, it, you could very easily get hurt. You could get hurt either place, but there were guys that have life sentences that have been working out for 20 years and were just super angry, yeah. you know, at the medium. And, and if you got hurt at the medium, it was probably really go bad. Uh, as opposed to you get hurt at the low, it's more like a, a, a fist fight in high school. So with knives. So anyway, I, so I'm there, I'm writing, I'm doing that. And at, there was a guy on the compound that came on the compound about that same time. His name was Frank Amadeo. Frank Amadeo is a, a rapid cycling bipolar with features of schizophrenia. Rapid cycling bipolar with features of schizophrenia. schizophrenia. So cycling. it's just constant, right? And so there are moments in, in his manic state where he, his reoccurring psychosis, I guess, is uh, that he believes, and since he was in his early teens, has believed that he is preordained by God to be emperor of the world. He's a lawyer, disbarred, stole close to $200 million from the federal government. They gave him 22 years and they sent him to Coleman. But it doesn't, this is the part I love. Uh -huh. The delusions don't affect his legal work. Uh -huh. This doesn't say a ton for legal community, but. How do you know he's delusional? I'm just asking questions. Yeah, he's, he's trust me. He, I, I, I mean, it's, it's not me. It's like the transcripts, the lawyers, the doctors, the, you know. Yeah. yeah there's a ton of, right. a ton. Uh, and then if you saw him in action, you'd be like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, he'd be com he would be completely normal. He would be having a completely normal conversation. Mm -hmm. And somebody would say something and he was, he'd go, that makes me so angry. I, 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 I can't, I'm not going to let them do that. When my legions march on Washington, we are going to burn the constitution and the president will kneel at my feet. And he goes, I'm going to need your transcripts. Mm -hmm. I'm going to need a, a 2255 form. We're going to file a, you know, and it would just like, and everybody would sit there and be like, okay, Frank, I'll get to this and I'll get, it was insane. It was the most insane. He was basically running a medium sized law firm from inside of the prison. Mm -hmm. He was training people. He taught the, he taught the, um, the legal research class and was training people on how to do legal research in prison, how to put together motions, how to fight uh, fight their cases, how to do the research, how to type them up, everything. He's teaching, he's teaching a law, it's, it's like a law school, right? Like he's teaching these guys. He, he, listen, they made such a mistake locking this guy up. So he's a great lawyer. Listen, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse because here's what happens is at this point, I don't talk to him for probably a, a year or so because everybody's saying he's crazy. You know, and he's, and for like a year he gets there, he's drooling out of the side of his mouth. They got him on a ton of medication. It takes him about a year to get him, them to take him off the medication. So he, he gets them to take him off the medication. And then he starts kind of stabilizing his mood by drinking Pepsi. Uh, I know. It, bro, it's crazy. I know it's crazy. I know how I see, I see you looking at me like yeah. this guy's delusion. I know. It works. But whatever works. So at some point, one of my buddies comes to me and says, look, you got to go talk to Frank. It, well, here's the other thing. Over the course of a year or two that he starts doing legal work for guys, he starts just taking on guys' cases. I'll do the motion. I'll do your legal work. I'll do this. Keeps him busy. But suddenly you start hearing people get released. You know, you, you know Jimmy just got 10 years knocked off his sentence. He's going to halfway house next month. You know, Tom got an immediate release. Frank's walking people up to R and D, shaking their hands. Guys are walking up to him in tears, crying. And and so you know, crazy or not, what what choice do I have? I I called three different lawyers on the street and said, "This is what happened. What can I do? What can I do?" They they had me. They told me to do this and this and this, and I worked with them. And then they decided not to proceed. And what can I do? And they said, "You're hit, bro." There's nothing you can do. You cannot in the middle in the in the Eleventh Circuit. You cannot force them to file a reduction on your behalf. You cannot do it. It's impossible. You're hit. You're done. It's over. I'd love to take your your money, Mr. Cox, but it's not going to happen. I, don't, I can't. I'm not just going to take your money. You're going to lose. 
three different lawyers. I talked to I, or TI's lawyer, told me, bro, it's not going to happen. It's over. So my buddy says, go talk to Frank. I said, well, why, why wouldn't I? I got nothing else to lose. So I go talk to Frank. He actually has a little manic moment. That little thing that I just showed you, that's exactly what he said the first time I talked to him. Based on your case. Yes. Yeah. I won't let this happen. He's like, I'm going to need your transcripts. I'm going to need you to get this. I need to see your indictment. I'm going to need your pre-sentence report. I'm going to need, I was like, okay. And I turned to my buddy. He's like, bro, I know. I know what you're thinking. It's fine. It's fucking crazy. And he's like, he's like I understand. Let just, what, ch what choice do you have? I was like, fuck. So Frank files a 2255 motion on my behalf stating that I'm not time barred, that Millie was, we file it against Millie stating that she was ineffective, mm -hmm. right? That she didn't understand the law. She had me plead to something because she thought I could get a reduction simply for doing Dateline Oh, by the way, when I was in the medium, the government came to me and asked me to be interviewed by American Greed. I do that. I'm interviewed. You know, they 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 get me on the phone. They talk to me. Everything. My the prosecutor wants me to do it. She's re-interviewed. Everybody's re-interviewed. It airs. Millie goes to them to the government. And says, "Look, reduce the sentence." They go, "No, Millie, it's not enough." Then they come to me and they ask me to write an a, an ethics and fraud course. I write an ethics and fraud course. The guy I write the course with, he f they flies up to um, Atlanta. He talks with, I think he drove up, but he goes up to Atlanta. He talks with the U.S. attorney, talks to Millie. She insists, if he does this, I will reduce his sentence. I will definitely consider this. Definitely consider. Yeah, definitely consider. And then we do it. It's being used all over the nation. Not enough. Consider so it. That's where, at this point, I go to Frank. I tell Frank what's happening. Frank says, yeah, this is, he goes, every time they asked you to do something, it reset the time bar. You have a year from that time to f file a 2255. Now, he insists that that was a viable argument. Nobody else does. But he said, I'm not going to let them do this. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to get your sentence reduced. Okay. Uh, Emperor. Okay, Emperor. <laughs> so uh, he is a character. Uh, anyway, he... So he files a 2255. The government comes back. They say he's time barred. Frank comes back. He, he you know, they answer his motion. He files a retort. Uh, they file, you know, it, it just goes back and forth. This goes on for six months to a year. And at some point I go to mail call and, you know, they call my name and they, they hand me this thing and I open it up and it says the government's filed a motion for a stay so that they can, they want the court to appoint me a lawyer and to discuss filing a rule 35, mm. reducing my sentence. And I, you know, I, I, I'm like, I read it, but I couldn't even understand. Like, well, I don't understand. So, I mean, I rushed to go find Frank. I show it to Frank and he says, he says, yeah, they're staying it. They're going to send you a lawyer and you're going to negotiate for how much they're going to re reduce your sentence. He says, it's perfect. So they fly this woman down. Her name was Esther Panich. She flies down. We comes to the visitation room. They bring me there, the lawyer's room, whatever they call it. The, and so we're sitting there and I remember we're talking and she says, uh, listen, your, your motion, your 2255 is written well, but honestly, you don't have much of a prayer. And um, they're offering you a one level reduction, which is 30 months. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, that's, that's not enough. And she said, well, I don't know what to tell you. Um, she said, they're willing to bring you back. And I was like, well, you know, I mean, I don't know. I got to talk to Frank. Frank said, I deserve this many levels. And you know, we're going back for, she goes, she, she who's Frank? And I go, Frank's the guy that's doing all my legal work. She goes, he didn't write all this. And I was like, no, she is who wrote it. And I, I explain it to her and she's like, he's an inmate. And I was like, yeah. And then, and she's, why is he here? And I tell her, well, cause he's, he stole a bunch of money from the federal government. Cause he's trying to take over the world. So I tell her that whole thing. And she's like, you're letting a, a, a mentally incompetent, you know, person do your legal work. And I was like, yeah, because all the competent attorneys wouldn't do it. They said, I didn't have a prayer. Your people said, I didn't have a prayer. And I said, Frank said he was going to, he could get this done. And she's like, well, I mean, you know, you don't like, I, I don't even know why they're offering you one level. I was like, well, Frank said, 
you know, and I'm like, Frank this, Frank that. And so she and I end up saying, she's like, you're taking advice from a, a legally an incompetent person. I said, yeah. And she said, you know, you really don't have a prayer. I said, then why are you here? I said, if they could crush me so easily, why are you here? I said, they're giving me one level. Let me talk to Frank. I'll let you know what we're going to do. So I leave. I call her a couple days later. I tell her Frank, and I talk to Frank. Frank said, go back, go back and argue for more. He said, I think the judge is going to give you more. He's going to give you at least, you know, between whatever he said, like six or seven levels or something. So I get, I get moved all the way back to Atlanta. The FBI agent comes to talk on my behalf. The guy that like multiple people show up to talk on my behalf. Wow. They say, you know, uh, Millie, who I filed the 2255 against. So I'm basically saying you, you're ineffective. You're incompetent. You know, but she knows the game. She's like, I, I get it. She she gets on the stand and testifies for me. So the judge goes, eh, you know, listen, I think we were asking for like nine levels or something outrageous. Prosecutor starts arguing for one level. And it, he said, listen, one level is not nearly enough for what Mr. Cox has done. He said, Mr. Cox, I know you're arguing for nine, uh, nine levels off your sentence. He goes, that was never going to happen. <laughs> I was like, it felt like I got slapped. And he said, so I'm, I'm going to go with six levels. No, no, I'm sorry. He said three levels. I'm going to go with three levels. He goes, which is, uh, which is seven years, which he said for somebody who has no arrest associated with his case. He said, I think it's pretty good. And that's my, that's his judgment and blah, 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 blah. And he hammered, but then puts the gavel down and walks off. And that's it. It's over. I got seven years. And I was hoping for more. So I get moved back to Coleman. I get moved back to Coleman and I go to up to Frank and I said, Frank, I got, I got seven years off. And he's like, I know, I know. I said, I, I don't mean to sound unappreciative. I said, I just I said, I was hoping for more. He goes, I was too. He said, it looks like we're going to have to eat this elephant one spoonful at a time. And he goes, something will come out. Something's going to happen. He said, keep your ears open. Something will happen. And I said, okay. And, you know, I honestly, by that point, I'd done, you know, I'd done eight years. And I remember like if I got a year off of the drug program and good time and this, and I had about eight or eight years left to go or something, nine years left. And I was like, you know, I can do that. I'll write. You know, I'd been writing. Um, by that point, I'd, I'd actually written a story. Like I got a book deal for Deveroli, you know. Um, and I ended up uh, writing a synopsis of a guy's story and I got him in Rolling Stone magazine and I got a book deal for that. Like I got an advance. It's like 3,500 bucks for being in prison, a prisoner to get a $3,500 advance. Like I'm a millionaire. It's a lot of money. So, and then we optioned the film rights, basically the synopsis that I wrote for this reporter journalist for Rolling Stone. He goes to Rolling Stone with my, with what I wrote and gives it to them and they okay it. They say, yeah, this is great. We want you to write an article based on this. Okay, he writes the article. He tells me that the article will be from him, his name, Guy Lawson, Douglas Dodd, which is the name of the kid I wrote the memoir about, and Matthew Cox. A couple of weeks before it's going, the article is going to be published, he tells me, Rolling Stone doesn't want my name on the article because I'm in federal prison and it doesn't look good. But don't worry, he's going to put my name in the article. And that's just as good. Um, and I argue, it's not just as good. It's not. I'm like, I, I would be, I would be an, a writer for Rolling Stone magazine. Like, you understand, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to come up with something here that I can rebuild my life as a true crime writer. That's no good. What the, and that wasn't so bad. That wasn't the worst. Of the worst of it was 90% of the article that he published was taken directly from what I sent him. Like, I mean, sick to my stomach, bro. Just sick over it. So, but they optioned, they optioned the life rights for that. And I got a piece of that. So there's like $7,000. I get a check for that. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I can keep writing because you have to understand writing on the computer there, they charge you. 
So I start right. Oh, they charge you for phone calls, writing, commas, every single thing costs money. So I start writing all these guys' stories. I start writing books. I had just come back from, went back to Atlanta, got re- got sent, seven years knocked off my sentence, come back. And I'm walking around the compound. Now, there was a guy that was there named Ron Wilson. Ron Wilson ran, in the, if you look in the newspaper, it says it's like a, a $100 million Ponzi scheme, but really it was $57 million. So he had lost $57 million. So it says 100, you know, they, you know, they always exaggerate because 57 is not enough. Ron ended up getting 19 and a half years. Ron was an old con man. Mm-hmm. Early 60s, 62, 61, I don't know. And uh, Ron, I, and I liked Ron. Um, so we're walking around the compound and he's like, so what are you going to do? I mean, you got, you got like eight or nine more years to go. And I was like, eh, you know, I'm going to keep writing. And when I get out of here, maybe I'll have a huge body of work and maybe I'll be able to sell it or maybe I'll be able to option some more stuff. And if I could get together with Rolling Stone or get with some of these magazines, mm-hmm. I could start writing for them and I could option those. Maybe I could walk out of here with something. So, right, right, right. So Ron was, who'd only been locked up like a year or so, he was cooperating with the secret service in his case against some of his co-defendants. Hmm. So he's, he's already been debriefed and he's cooperating. He's actually thinking he might get brought back to have to testify at a trial. Hmm. We're talking and we're walking and he keeps saying, you know, even if I, even if they, they charge those guys and even if this happens, they're not going to reduce my sentence. They're not going to cut my sentence. And, you know, first of all, well, probably because you stole a bunch of money from pension funds and churches that didn't help your case. But I don't say that. Uh, so I, I say, oh, they have to, bro. They'll have to. They've, they've, you know, if you cooperate, they're going to have to. And if they don't, we'll have Frank file a 2255. And he's like, uh, ah, that crazy. Mother. Um, so he says, uh, okay. He's like, yeah, yeah, you don't understand. You don't understand. So this goes on for months. And, I, and I'm like, what is the problem? And he says, you know, they think I hid Ponzi scheme money, you know? And he'd actually dug up like five or $6 million in Ponzi scheme proceeds that he dug. He, I mean, he, he buried in these. Oh, literally. Literally buried in aluminum ammunition canisters. Mm-hmm. It was a super interesting guy. So he actually went and dug them up and gave them to him. And I'm like, well, you gave them all the money. It's, you didn't hide anything. Relax. It's not a big deal. They're not going to find anything. So don't worry about it. And so he mentions it oh, a couple weeks later, a couple weeks later. And then one day I go, bro, why do you keep bringing this up? Like, what are you concerned about? They're, it's not going to happen. And he said, can I trust you? And I went, probably not. And he goes, <laughs> I did hide some money. I was like, okay. I said, did you, did you bury it in a can somewhere? And he's like, no. He said, I, I um, gave my wife like 150000 in cash. I said, okay, well, she's not going to say anything. She's using it. He said, no, you don't understand. Since then, she found out I was having an affair. And she, we're going to get a divorce. And she hates me. And I think she'll turn that money in just to make sure that I don't get a reduction. Because if you lie to the FBI, they're not going to, it doesn't matter what you've done for them. They won't give you anything. And so he's, I mean, I'm sorry, it's Secret Service or anybody. He is clearly lied to the Secret Service mm-hmm. at this point. If she goes and says, this is what he gave me. Mm-hmm. So he's like, I was like, oh, wow. And he's like, and I gave my, my brother's holding maybe 30,000 for me. And at that moment, I was like, wow, like this poor guy. No, that's not what I thought at all. What I thought was, is that enough to get me a sentence reduction? <laughs> You son of a bitch. <laughs> and uh, I went and I sat man. there. And you know what I thought? I thought, I, I, I did. I thought, no, I thought that's not enough. That's not enough. It's nothing. That's not even $200,000. Yeah. Like, and they didn't want to give me a reduction. My prosecutor was pissed that I got seven years off. She wanted me to get 30 months. Mm-hmm. She's not going to give me anything. It's up to her. She's not going to do it. So I go, I lay down, I go to bed like a month later. I'm on the phone with my lawyer because I had written, remember I wrote a man, uh, my, I had a manuscript for my book and I wanted to put some of the stuff that was said at my, in my sentencing in the book. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to get my lawyer to mail me my transcripts 
and she hadn't done it. So I called her and I said, listen, you said you were going to, she's like, oh God, man, I'm so sorry. I'm so busy. I'll do it. I'll do it. it." And then she went, this is Esther. She goes, so what else is going on in there? And I, and this, she never wanted to talk to me. Like she didn't, you know, when they were paying her, she didn't want to talk to me. And, and I was like, what do you mean? Nothing. I just need my transcription. She's like, nothing's happening. There's nothing you want to talk about. And I was like, and I went, you know what? You know what? There's something weird happened there. Listen to this. And I told her about Ron Wilson. Mm-hmm. And she goes, hold on. She, she looks him up on the computer. She goes, oh, wow, this is a bad guy. This is a bad guy. And he told you, then you know where to, absolutely. And, she, and I can tell you exactly. And she goes, okay, okay, okay. She goes, uh, let me look into this. I go, okay. So a week later, a, a CO comes to me and goes, hey, Cox. And I go, what's up? He goes, listen, at the next move, because you know they have controlled moves. All the doors are locked and they open them up for 10 minutes so you can run to the chow hall or mm-hmm. you can run to the, you can't run though, there's no running on the compound, right. but you can walk Move fast quickly, yeah. yes, to the rec yard uh, or the library, whatever. He says, at the next move, go to SIS, you know? So I go to SIS on the next move, but I, I was used to going there, by the way, because I, I was constantly ordering Freedom of Information Acts and they would, so I'd order your, your an inmate and I'd order, I'm writing a story for you and I'd order it and they'd send it to me and then they would catch it and they'd be like, why are you getting Lex's mm-hmm. information? So they'd call me down there and I'd go, no, I ordered it for him and I'm writing a story. And I'd already been in Rolling Stone and everything. They're like, what's the story? And I tell them the story. They got a pretty good story here. And so I go down there, but this is different. This, the guy answers the door and his guy, they call him Bulldog. He was a real asshole. Uh, he was a Lieutenant at SIS and he's like, uh, come in, get in here, Cox, sit down. And he dials the phone. And he goes, here, you got to talk to this guy. And I'm like, what? And I pick up the phone. I'm like, hello. And the guy goes, hey, this is Agent Griffin with the Secret Service. I understand you know where Ron Wilson is, has uh, hidden Ponzi scheme money. I, whoa, 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 whoa. I want something in writing. I want, you know, so I start doing that and they go, okay. And then I get his, his email address and we start emailing each other back and forth. Mm-hmm. And he ends up sent, getting a letter from the U.S. attorney in South Carolina that says they will consider it substantial assistance if they if they make arrests or recover a substantial amount of money. Mm-hmm. That's the best I'm going to get is consider. So I start talking to this guy and he starts asking me questions about Ron Wilson. Like, hey, ask him this, ask him this. So I'm like, bro, I got to kind of work that into a conversation. That's an odd <laughs> thing to ask. Yeah. So this goes on for six months. So I'm asking questions and I'm typing up little reports and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a prison snitch now. So I'm not just like cooperate. I'm now I'm a prison. Snitch. So I've, L, I've moved well, down. I've moved down actually from being just a cooperating witness or because a, you're in prison. Is yes, that what makes you a prison, prison snitch? snitch. You oh. can't even really say, um, no, you could say prison rat. You could say prison rat. I think prison snitch. I think that's probably the closer to the term that, most guys would use. What's the difference between a snitch and a rat in prison? I'm not sure. I, it's, it rolls off the tongue better. Prison rat doesn't sound as good as prison snitch. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about this. So what happens is I'm, I'm asking Wilson questions periodically. And at some point they contact me and they say, listen, Wilson's about to get some bad news. And I go, okay. Um, and they go, he's, you know, like, I don't want to tell you what it is. Let us know what happens. So like two days go by. And one day, uh, Wilson comes up to me one day and says, Cox, Cox. And I'm like, oh, shit. I'm like, hey, what's up? You know? And he's like, oh, my God, you're not going to believe this. I got indicted. I was like, what? What happened? <gasps> no. Yeah. My wife, they questioned my wife and my brother. And my brother, my wife walked in. First, she said, I don't have nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. The next day, the brother walks in and gives them $150,000 in cash. And so the next day, the wife comes back and gives them $250,000 in cash and a bunch of uh, silver, like gold bullion and silver, you know, because he was a, his, his Ponzi scheme was based off of silver. Uh, you know, he was going to invest in silver for you. So half a million dollars, they turn over half a million. I'm like half a million dollars. I thought she was like a hundred thousand or something. Mm-hmm. And he was, he's like, I know, I didn't know I could trust you. I'm like, Ron, 
what are you doing? I thought we were. So he, um, so I'll tell you something just for the icing on the cake, by the way, yeah. the icing on the cake. Let me, yeah, let me explain one, one more thing. Yeah. There's so if you're going to, if somebody cooperates with the federal government, let's say I get arrested and they go, you want to help yourself? And you go, yeah, okay. Um, look, uh, uh Jimmy is a, he lives next to me and he's running a meth house, you know, a meth lab, whatever. And they go and they raid Jimmy and he gets arrested. You're going to get something off for that. Not a lot, but you're going to get something. Now, and they could just say, we were going to bust him anyway. We were already on to him, right? Now, the next level would be you wear a wire. So I wore a wire and I, I was in danger. Now, keep in mind, I'm asking this guy questions inside federal prison. I'm in danger. So whatever, that's like the next level. You're active. You're taking an active participate participation in the um, investigation. Mm-hmm. And the third level would be you actually get on the stand and you cooperate and you, you testify. Mm-hmm. There's no better cooperation than that. So when Wilson says to me, they're going to move me back to South Carolina. They've indicted me. They charged me. What do you think I should do? And I go, I think you should go to trial. Because I know they'll have to call me as a witness. Yeah. Just to let you know, because I don't, I don't want you to, I don't want to walk out of here and have you feeling, <laughs> feeling like, hey, there's some, there's some good to this guy. No. <laughs> so I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to cut Wilson like a fish. So, yeah. but you are putting yourself in danger if you get on a stand, right? I'm already in danger. If, if people there heard what I was doing, I probably would have been in. Does that increase the chance of them hearing or no? If you it, it does, but it also increases my ability to get more off my sentence. Yeah, that's true. So what happens is a couple days later, he's on what's called the pack out, right? They're going to move him mm-hmm. maybe a week later. So they come and get him. They move him. He gets back there to South Carolina and he pleads guilty. He, he, they sentence him. He gets six months added on. So he's now from 19 and a half to 20 years. Uh, and, and by the way, when COVID hit, he was released. So he only ended up doing like six years on a 20 year sentence because he was older. He's by that point, he's 66, 67 years old. You know, he's an old, anybody older than 55 was endangered, especially in the prison. So they had a, a, a COVID thing where they were releasing these guys and sending them home on ankle monitors. Like he's an old man. He's not, he, he he's not going to hurt. He's not, he's not a danger. So they sent him home. So he ended up doing, so he didn't even serve the six months. He didn't even serve the original sentence, whatever. Not that I care. So I'm just saying, it makes you feel like poor Ron. It's okay. So his wife got like a hundred year, a hundred, she got like a hundred hours of community service or something or 60 hours. And I think his brother got six months papers. They, they got charged with um, obstruction of justice, mm-hmm. you know, and they didn't, neither one of them, you know, it's like six months probation and community service, nothing. So when we, tr- I turn around, I'm waiting for my reduction waiting, waiting. After about 90 days after this guy gets sentenced, maybe six months, I send a letter, hey, what's going on to the prosecuting, to my prosecutor there, the prosecutor of both districts, no response. Then I go to Frank, I explain to Frank, and Frank has known what's going on the whole time. And Frank goes, uh, okay, I'm going to file a 2255. So we file a 2255. Government comes back and they first thing they say is, your honor, we don't know about any cooperation. We've never heard about any cooperation. So, of course, then we submit the letter that we have. The judge comes back and the the judge ends up saying it's a little complicated, but he ends up saying, look, I don't have jurisdiction to hear this because you're you may be time barred. But I'm going to let the the appeals court hear it. Now, typically you have to you have to get what's called a, like a right of sort of a certification to appeal. You have to make sure that you actually have a case. Mm-hmm. He says, I'm waiving the cert and I'm waiving the $500 fee to file with them. He said, and I'm, he's, he basically expedites it for me, which is a subtle way of telling the prosecutor, I think he's got something and I'm sending it up there. And he, and the way he writes his motion, it's basically saying, I don't have, the jurisdiction to hear it, to do anything, but they do. 
They need to do it. And I'm paving the way. You don't have to pay any money and you don't need that cert. So the prosecution immediately comes back. They file a, a, a one level reduction. And we immediately, Frank files something saying, hey, stop. We don't want the reduction. We don't want the one level. We want to come back to court. Please don't, don't rule on it. So the judge says, okay, I'm freezing everything. I'm, I'm putting a stay on everything. I'm going to give this guy a lawyer to try and figure out what you're going to do. They fly down a lawyer, Leanne Weber. So she comes and, and she comes and sees me and uh, she says, listen, I, I, I see that you want to go back and fight this and this, but you know, honestly, I don't think you're going to get anything more than one level. Uh, I talked to the prosecution. They said they'll give you, but well, she said, I can work on trying to get you two levels, but you don't have much of a prayer. You're going to get crushed. And I said, well, then, then why are you here? If they can crush me so easy, why don't they do it? Why would they pay you like they pay them like 12 grand or something just to fly down and all your expenses to, to negotiate for me? Why not crush me? And she's like, I, I don't know. I said, well, Frank said four levels. And she's like, who's Frank? I go, Frank's the guy that wrote all this. And she's like, oh, is he, is he an attorney? And I go, is he in here? And I'm like, yeah, he's in here. She's like, why is he in here? And I tell her he was taking over the world. Yeah. And she says, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And I said, I understand. But Frank said, and she's like, you're listening to an incompetent, you know, I'm right, like, yeah, absolutely. Right. And she, and Frank said, four level, we want four levels. She, he said, for me to tell you, we want four levels. She says, okay. She leaves. She goes to the U.S. attorney. We argue two levels. They come back and say two levels. No. We go back and forth. We start filing motions saying we want to go back. We want a hearing. We want to bring back all the FBI agents, the Secret Service agents. And she's like, what, do you want to turn this into a circus? Exactly what do I want to do. I want to turn it into the biggest circus because I've already got one level. Mm -hmm. They come back one day. She says, listen, three levels is the best you're going to get. She said, so uh, I guess you'll be moved back here. We'll go to the hearing. I said, no, 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 I'll take three levels. And she says, what are you talking? She said, you said four levels. You said Frank wouldn't take, let you take anything less than four. I said, no, Frank said to tell you four. I was happy with three. I wanted you to argue for four. I'm good with three. I'm out of here in like a year. Yeah. So, and I don't want to be moved back. I don't want to have to get on that bus. You know what it's like to be moved? It's horrible. So I said, I just want the three levels. So then we argue about the wording for about two, three months, and then they file it. And then I get five years knocked off my sentence because three levels at this at the level I was at now isn't seven years. Every level, you get a little less time. So I get five years off. So now I've got 12 years knocked off my sentence. At this point, I maybe have a year and a half to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's doable. So I was super, super happy. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. Uh, and I'm sorry, bro. Um, but every time I think about it, and I, I just feel like I have to say it. Like, I'm um, Frank, I'm gonna insane. But I can like I didn't have a fucking prayer without that guy. And as crazy as he is, and much of a pain in the ass as he was, um, like I could never repay him, bro. Like, like I'm not, I shouldn't be here. I'm supposed to be in prison right now. My out date was third, was 2030 without that guy. Where does he know? He got himself out. He didn't do all that time. He got himself out. I don't even know how he did it. He, they even threw him back in prison again for six months and he got himself out again. Uh, he's insane. He's incredible. He's insane, but he's incredible. Is he really that insane? He's though? in Orlando. Is he, I mean, he seems like, he seems like a good lawyer and a good man. He, he's, he's, he's great. He's great. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind I would be in prison right now if it wasn't for him. And he's done this for others? Walk people right out. 10 years off, five years off, nine years off, 10 years. I mean, it's, I didn't pay, and I didn't pay for one thing. I didn't pay for my stamps. He paid for everything. Sounds like the other lawyers don't really believe it's possible, and he does. 
It's interesting. Well, I think he's he was willing to he's willing to badger them into doing, you know, what they should have done to begin with. I actually wrote a book about it, which he loved. About him. About him and his story. His it's so over the top what happened with him. Um no, I mean, literally, it tried to take over the Congo. I mean, there's a, a documentary about it. There's, it's called Nine Days in the Congo. It's an insane story. I'm, I'm, a, this is one of those stories that's just like, how is this not a movie? It's not a movie yet? No, I don't, I've pitched it several times and, uh, it'd be, it would be great. But so I wrote a synopsis and I turned that into a book. What's the name of the book? Oh, it's insanity. It's insanity. Yeah. But about it, like a year and a half later, like I ended up getting out of prison and I went to the halfway house. 